So we're still we're in the book of Galatians. Last week, like I said, whenever we kind of started off and we were praying, I talked about the fact that in Paul's what we covered last week was Paul's narrative regarding his life having to do with his past because he was he was addressing a situation that was happening in the region of Galatia where the churches that he had founded and he had preached the gospel to them and he had taught them the truth and then now after he had left, uh, people had come in behind him. Scholars call them Judaizers. Some scholars call them Judaizers. Uh, but essentially what they were, were they were Jewish. You know, the first people to get saved were Jews. A lot of times people don't understand these things. They don't read the context or the history of the church. But, you know, the Apostle Paul was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. All the original disciples were Jews. Some people say Luke was of Grecian origin. But, but the truth is, is that the majority of the people that were getting saved were Jewish. All right, so the early Christians were Jewish. And so there was this Jewish mindset that was remaining within them because uh, they, they had grown up that way. They had been taught all of those things. Plus the fact that we've said this before, that even when you look at the fall in the garden and what happened with Adam and Eve, that immediately after the fall, they attempted through their own performance or their own work of their own hands to remedy their, pro their problem. What do you mean by that? Well, they took fig leaves, they sewed them together, and they attempted to cover the nakedness, which was the exposure of their sin. But God, in my this is my interpretation of the scripture, performed the first sacrifice when he offered up that animal and took the skins of that innocent animal that had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's sin, and he clothed Adam and Eve with the sacrifice of that of that animal. And from that moment moving forward, throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, we're seeing a progression of revelation regarding the sacrifice that was required in order to make man right in the eyes of God. But yet man, because his, I call it a default position, kind of like a computer that goes back to a resting screen, man has something in him because of the fall that wants to perform, that wants to be recognized for what it is that he does. He loves his works. Don't say that he doesn't because each and every person in here, if you're truly a Christian and God really loves it, lives inside of your heart, that you know that there's been times that you want it. I can admit it. I still see it sometimes in me. I want to be, I want, I want to be recognized for, for what, for what you, you see what I'm saying? And so, so we take these works and we want people to recognize what it is that we're doing. I'm not proud of it, but it, it's something in me. It's part of the fall. And we see that also with Cain. Listen. That was Cain's problem. He was a tiller of the ground. But God required an animal, a blood sacrifice. And God rejected Cain's offering. It's not because it's a problem to bring a peace offering. But when you look at the Levitical offerings, the peace offering comes after. The first way to do order of business to do with God is that blood has to be shed. Innocent life has to be taken in order to pay the wages of sin, which is death. Therefore, death had to ensue to pay the price. But because of this default position that lies in the heart of man, he's repetitively attempting to bring his own vegetables to God like Cain did. He's repetitively trying to sew his own fig leaves together. And it takes on all manners of various forms, but it's all the same. It becomes a legalistic, performance-based walk with God. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. I want to try to give you a little bit of an illustration that I hope you'll be able to understand it. Because listen, when you're talking to people... Or when you're in the midst of a legalistic type of Christianity, you can't even see it. If somebody tried to have a conversation with you about it, you would fight them tooth and nail. You would vehemently deny that you're trying to make yourself right with God through what it is that you would do. What I'm trying to say is this, is that really a, a specific clarification point is that most people understand that Jesus had to die on the cross to get us saved. Most people get that. If somebody's not preaching that, dude, you need to close your ears, da, 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 close your Bible and run out the back door. I mean, that's just simple stuff right there. But what, where most people don't understand is that the same way you received him, well, you're going to use this scripture again later, is the same way you continue to walk in him. The same grace that saves you is the same grace that sanctifies and matures you. The same avenue that grace flows into you in order to change you is faith. Just like it was the same faith that converted you. And we're gonna, that's really the majority of what the Apostle Paul is going to talk about in where, where we left off from the last time. But once again, these men were coming behind Paul. And the problem of the teaching was that they were adding something to the finished work of Jesus on the cross. 
The problem with the teaching is Jesus and dot, 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 instead of Jesus, it is finished. So what these Jewish men that these scholar that these Judaizers are called were wanting them to do was they were wanting the Gentiles, these Galatians, we drew a map last time, talked about how Canaan is here, Asia Minor is here, the region of Galatia is here where all the churches were, if you would imagine that in your mind. So these were Gentiles. The, the, the King James Bible calls them heathen. What it means is, is that they were pagan worshipers of false gods that had not known the God of the Jews. But now they heard the gospel and they were saved. They weren't circumcised to begin with because they weren't Jewish in their culture. But now these Judaizers are coming in and they're saying, you got Jesus, but in order to really be right with God, you need to be circumcised. The issue that we deal with is, is that most of the time, there's not going to be a false teacher today that's going to come around, hey, look, all the men in the church, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird on you, but I'm just saying, you got to know it feels uncomfortable when you use the word circumcision, but it's throughout the Bible. There, some false teacher is going to stand up behind a pulpit and say, okay, all you men that aren't circumcised, I need you on the left side of the church because, listen, after this, we're going to go perform the ritual. That's not going to happen. But what we do still have today is a legalistic form of Christianity that says Jesus and some type of a supplementation that says and, and required to be done that says that no, the work's not finished. And you might not even feel it that way, but that's what it is. It's a specific, a ritual. You got to go through a certain ritualistic form of water baptism in order to add to for you really to be converted. Well, I'm not going to get into that too deep, but I'm just saying, no, that's Jesus and. All right. Uh, you have to uh, read a certain amount of the Bible because, you know, you're required to do this thing. Listen, there's not it's a it's a beautiful thing when you study the scripture to, to show yourself approved because, a, 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 you know, a worker that rightly divides the word of truth shall not be ashamed. Whenever the Apostle Paul preached to those whenever he was on his missionary journey. It said that those of Berea were no more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they went home and they studied what Paul taught them for themselves. So nobody's trying to question whether or not the, the gospel should be studied. The Bible should be studied. It should be poured through, dissected, and studied time and again. But when you begin to think in your mind that you, through what you're reading, through what you're studying, through the devotion that you're giving to your Christian works are now making yourself pleasing in the eyes of God because you have performed something. Now you have completely changed the sphere, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, from being under grace to now you've entered in under a wall. Because it's a, now the focal point is upon what you're performing rather than what he performed. Amen. You can't earn righteousness. Oh, you might read the Bible more than me. You might feel like you study the Bible more than me. You might even know the Bible better than me. But that don't make you more righteous than me. Because you and I have been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. He is the manifestation of God's righteousness come in the flesh. And he is the exchange where the guilt he took of mine upon him and, a, and gave me the gift of his righteousness. That's Romans 5, 17. That's the eternal plan of God. The righteousness exchange. Amen. Because you and I were guilty born of Adam. Born in sin. Amen. Adam's the father of all humanity. It's sin, the sinful nature. Paul called him the old Adam. The old man. Ha has spread through the entirety of the human race. All are guilty except one. Yes. Hallelujah. Born of incorruptible seed. Born of the virgin. There was no sin in him. And that's why we must be born again. And so that's the, I don't know that I really do a well enough job of explaining because it's a, it is somewhat of an abstract thought. And sometimes we get caught up in concrete things. We want to be able to see the lines demarcated very clearly. Listen to me. When you enter, when you go from grace to legalism, it's a very abstract concept. You don't even realize because there's a spell connected to it. We're going to get into that a little bit this morning also. You won't even realize it begins to blind you. False religion, false doctrine blind you. You can think you're the most spiritual, the most powerful, the most learned, the most educated Christian on the face of the earth. Nobody can teach you. You ever been around somebody like that? Mm -hmm. Try to talk to him about the gospel. And you know, listen to me, there's been times that I've talked to people that were smarter than me. Come on, man. I'm not the smartest person in the world. I get that. I've done my work. But, but at the same time, have you ever known in your heart of hearts, you're sitting here trying to talk to this person. You've done, you've been where they were. That's what the apostle Paul is doing in this, in that first part of the narrative. Don't do this. I've already been here. 
When he talks about Romans chapter 7, that's what he's talking about. He, he says, but when he, he was, I was alive without the law once, but then the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now we can, you can sit here and try to argue with me. Oh, that's not talking about before he, he was saved. It was talking about after he was saved. He embraced law as a Christian and it caused the sinful nature, because that's what it's talking about in Romans 7, the noun of sin to revive in his life. And just like grace allows spiritual victory to flow through you, whenever you walk under law, it allows the flesh, it allows the, the power of sin to have its way with you. And you can sit here and you can try to have a conversation with somebody and they're relatively knowledgeable. They can quote scripture. They know where scripture is, but they're blinded through this legalistic bewitching spirit that has made them to believe that they're in the right thing when in reality they're in the wrong thing. And you can sit there all day long and you can try to convince them. And believe me, brothers and sisters, I have tried plenty of time on multiple occasions until finally I can now recognize that spirit real quick. And I don't want to say it the wrong way because I don't want to come across the wrong way, but I ain't wasting my time and my breath no more. Amen. If they got, if somebody has an unteachable spirit, I'm moving past. Mm -hmm. I'll probably just agree with them. Dude, I'm tired. I, I, I've been confronting false doctrine for so long. I'm still going to preach the truth. I'm still going to expose false doctrine. But whenever I come up against a, an unteachable spirit, I, it is not my job to convince them. And I will tell them what I got to say, but then that's it. All right, that's another story. So they're coming in and they're saying it's circumcised. But I want you to know it's not circumcision. It's any form of works that brings you under legalism that makes you think that I can do something that's going to please God. No, there's only one that pleased him. His name was Jesus. Whenever Jesus went down in the water, the heavens opened, the Father spoke. That's one, that's, that's one question I have for the oneness. The heavens opened, the Father spoke, the Spirit descended like a dove upon the man Christ Jesus. This is my son. In him I am well pleased. Whatever the Mount of Transfiguration, he was transfigured before them. The Greek scholar Ken Thuy says that which was truly in him, his deity, showed forth that day. That's what the whole glory, that was a glorification that took place in the eyes, in the physical realm for them to see. That which was truly, though he was in the form of God, Philippians 2, 6. He did not consider it something to be grasped to, but instead he humbled himself. On that day that he was transfigured, the deity that was in him shone through. So what I want you to, but what I want you to see is this. We stopped where Peter used Peter, where Paul used Peter as an illustration of a problem that happened in Antioch, if you'll remember that. Before these men, these Judaizers, had come to Antioch, Peter was sitting at the table in the church of Antioch, and he was eating with the Gentiles. We went through a long, drawn-out process where we explained that there was a conference in Jerusalem that had taken place where Paul and Peter were there with James and the leadership, and they were saying, listen, we cannot expect these Gentiles to be circumcised. This had already taken place when, by the time this thing went down in Antioch. Plus, in addition to that, Peter was already on the roof of Simon the Tanner whenever the sheets were brought down and there were unclean animals in there. And God told Peter, rise, kill, eat. And what did Peter say three times? Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. But what God was explaining to Peter was that it was now time for the Gentiles to hear the gospel. So Peter had already received that revelation. He had already preached at Cornelius' house. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now he goes to the conference and he agrees with Paul that we can't expect Gentiles to be circumcised. Now he's at the house in Antioch and he's sitting down and he's eating with unbelieving Gentiles who aren't circumcised. And then all of a sudden the Judaizers show up. And next thing you know, Peter doesn't sit with the Gentiles anymore. Why? Because it was against the Jewish law for a Jew to sit and eat with unclean. And all of a sudden, Peter pulls himself away from this situation and it caused so much hypocrisy in the church that even Barnabas was drawn away with the hypocrisy. Paul said, when I saw that they erred in the truth, I withstood him to the face. Paul publicly rebuked the apostle Peter in front of everyone. Because he was openly causing trouble for the church in Antioch. Paul is seeing that they were going the wrong way. He brought the connection. And when we start reading right here, Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 17, we're in that same context. Paul has just explained the situation that took place with Peter, using him as an illustration. And then now he's about to get into some theology about the truth of the gospel. 
Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. He said, but if while we, now I'm going to kind of break some of this down because some, some of the, Paul's letters, if you're not really familiar with the behind the background of what's going on, it becomes kind of difficult to understand. But when, when he says, but while we, he's talking about Jews, because that's the context. Peter was a Jew. He dissimulated and moved away from the, from the heathen. So he says, if we, the Jews, seek to be justified by Christ. So that's what these Judaizers are saying. They're saying, we, we got Jesus, but, all right? So they admitted they needed Jesus, but they want to add some stuff. So we seek to be justified by Christ. We ourselves also are found sinners. See, in order for a Jew to admit that he needs Jesus, he's going to have to admit that he, that he wasn't right in his Jewishness. Does that make sense? He's going to have to come to the realization that if I need Jesus, then I wasn't right and that I'm a sinner like the Gentile. So he says, we ourselves are also found sinners. We admit that we need Jesus. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Because while they were saying they needed Jesus, they were also saying they needed to add to. Because essentially what they were saying was that Paul was teaching that, G that when you received Christ and you felt the way you did about, about the way Paul did about the scriptures, that you were abandoning the law. And in order to abandon the law, that in and of itself was a sin. So they were saying, no, we had to have both. We got to have Jesus and we got to continue on with the law. Which is actually, so they were actually considered to be breaking the law if they moved away only towards Jesus. And so then Paul's question is, so what? It, does that mean that Christ is the minister of sin? Is Christ telling us to break the law and therefore now people are becoming sinners? And Paul says, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. See, this is really what Peter did. Peter recognized as a Jew that he needed Jesus. Peter recognized that, that the law should not cause a wall between him and his, and his Christian brethren. And he sat down to eat with them. But then when these men came, what did Peter do? He turned around and he tried to go build back up again that which had already been destroyed. And Paul's saying, no, this is what the sin is. It's not for me to forsake the law for righteousness. Because the law will make no man righteous. Jesus is the righteousness of God. That's why God gave the law to begin with, to show sinful man that you can't keep the law. You might get this jot right, that tittle right, this little circumstance right, but listen, somewhere in there, there's something that you have failed. And if you're not going to do the whole thing, then you can't be righteous. you got to be able to do the whole thing all the time, every time, or else you're standing now in your own guilt. And so that's what Paul said. No, if I build again the things which I've destroyed, then I make myself a transgressor. For through the law, I am dead to the law. Let's go real quick to Colossians 2.14. I just want to talk to you about that for a second. Basically what Paul's saying right here is that the law required a sacrifice. Listen. The sacrifice was required before the law was ever in existence, right? Because right? we just talked about that in the garden. God brought forth the sacrifice. Abel brought forth the sacrifice. God made covenant with Abraham whenever he uh, provided sacrifice. And God, as a fire, walked through the midst of the carcasses. God had been planning sacrificial system before the law ever even came into existence, before there ever was a nation called Israel. But I want you to see right here in Colossians 2, 14 and 15. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's talking about the law, which was contrary to us. The law was against us. He took it out of the way. How did he do it? Because he nailed it to his cross. What is it? We've talked about this before. And acceded to the law. He nailed the law to his cross. Jesus destroyed the power of sin at the cross. Jesus destroyed the power of law over people's lives to the cross. The law stated that there had to be a death. Paul said, I was a, I'm dead to the law through the law. The law required a death. Jesus provided that death. Now my faith in that death now frees me from being under the restriction of the law. Because he couldn't keep it to begin with. He says right here, that I might live unto God. Now, this is the beauty of this. This is my favorite verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And now this life, uh, with, now this life which I now live in the flesh, talking about our physical body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Now, before we move forward, I want you to know that this is that, that situation that we oftentimes draw on the board. This is the same thing as Romans chapter 6. I'll come over here to save myself some space. But this is when it says, I've been crucified with Christ. We talk about old Adam. First birth, born in Adam. You hear the gospel, right? You heard the gospel. Somebody told you the gospel. So let me ask you this. Whenever he told you the gospel, whoever he was or she was, did, did it involve the fact that you were a sinner? <laughs> did it involve the fact that you were a sinner? Did it involve the fact that you needed a sacrifice for your sin? Did it involve the fact that there had to be a blood sacrifice? Did it involve all of those things and that you had to repent of your sin and that you had to receive Christ? It should have in some way, shape, or form involved that or else you might not have got saved. I'm just trying to say it. That, because that's the gospel. <laughs> and so when you heard that, because you were born in Adam, and you were born broken and dead, and you needed not just Jesus and his miracles, not just Jesus and his teachings, Jesus as a sacrifice. That's the plan of salvation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whenever you put faith that day in Jesus, a miracle happened. I'm telling you, this is what Romans chapter 6 teaches a miracle happened where the old man that was born of Adam was baptized into him. This is supposed to be rest in peace. Was baptized into him and was buried with him in his death and in, in, in his burial. And then Jesus, Jesus was raised from the dead. This is Jesus. We too should walk in newness of life. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Is that the old man born of Adam, that's what really happened when you were born again. Many people teach that Romans chapter 6 is water baptism. I disagree with that. There's no water in the Greek text. The idea is that a spiritual miracle happened on the day that you believed. When conversion took place, in God's mind, the old man that you were that was born of Adam was baptized. Because you got to look at the original in the Greek. The original word for word baptism. Whenever you, whenever you put faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit took you and he baptized you into the person of Jesus. And in the mind of God, you became one, united with him, interconnected with him in his death. God's mind, old Matt died, interconnected to him in his burial. Old Matt's dead and buried. And even as Jesus was raised from the dead, the same spirit that raised him from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies. That you too should walk in newness of life. A spiritual miracle connecting you to Jesus Christ and him crucified. The eternal plan of God through the ages has now caused a radical change on the inside of you. You've now become a, a partaker of the divine nature. You were born corrupted with Adam's nature. Now you become a partaker of the divine nature. And now this process, this walk begins. I've been crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And now this life I live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and he gave himself yes. for me. But look at this. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Hmm. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know, the word right, frustrate right there means to reject or to cast off. And in this case, it's talking about grace. To reject or to cast off grace. I don't cast off grace. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Look at Romans 5, verses 1 through 2. We just, we just covered this. But listen, we're talking about grace. I want to make a point here. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith. Now, if you want to shout it out, shout it out. At what does it mean to be justified? Declared. declared innocent. Thank you. Specifically declared innocent because it's, it's, a, it's a declaration. God is saying you're innocent. Amen? Different than standing. That means righteousness. But it's the same thing. You're righteous, so God declares it. You are righteous. But I can remember when that, how are you justified? Right? I can remember when I was trying to talk to my, my nephew one time about, about the message of the cross. I can remember when I was trying to talk to my nephew one time about the finished work of Christ. And he was like, I just don't really understand exactly what you're saying. And I said, okay. And I brought him to this scripture right here. I said, look, read this. And so we read. I said, you see the word cross there? He said, no. I said, you see the word blood there? He said, no. I said, but what I'm trying to tell you is this passage right here is screaming the word cross. Screaming the word blood. 
screaming the word sacrifice. Why? What are you talking about? Because it's through his sacrifice that your ability to be declared righteous by God to be justified took place to begin with. Yeah. You were guilty. God was declaring you condemned and guilty because you were born of Adam. But now Paul has already explained that because of Jesus, the righteousness of God, and him offering himself as a sacrifice, the redemption that we gain through his blood, hallelujah, you now have been made righteous and now God declares it so. And listen, it's because you've been justified that you have peace with God. Next verse. But not only that, access to grace. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the difference between frustrating grace and having access to grace. Right? Whenever you're justified, God declares you as innocent because of the fact that you put faith in the sacrifice of Christ. Now God says you're innocent. You have peace with God. You have access to grace. But if you move from under grace back under law, you frustrate the grace of God. You cast it aside. You reject it. I've said it many times before. If you follow the teaching of the Judaizers, what you're really saying is, is that if it's got to be Jesus and, you're basically slapping the Lord in the face and saying what you did was not enough. If there's something that I got to add to what Jesus did, then what Jesus did wasn't enough. All right. The argument of the false teachers would be that for someone to forsake the law in order to embrace Christ would be breaking the law, therefore a sin. Paul's argument reaches back to what Peter did. And if that's the case, then what Peter did, really what Paul's explaining, no, Peter didn't sin when he sat down with the Gentiles. Peter sinned when he got up and walked away because he was trying to keep the law at the same time that he was Christian. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, and I don't know that I'll do a great job of explaining it, I hope I do, is that I like to use this word sphere a lot. Uh, I've been helping Sierra write some poems, and one of one of them I, ha I helped her write had to, had something to do with a metaphor, and it had to do with clay on a wheel, and it said like clay on the wheel is me on earth, while the clay can't feel, I feel the hurt. So because the idea was the clay was like the person on the wheel that was spinning on the earth that was spinning, so it's metaphorical. These things are spheres. If you can look at them like neighborhoods and somewhere that you live, all right. And so you can live under law or you can live under grace. You can live in the neighborhood of law or you can live in the neighborhood of grace. When you were first born, you were born of Adam, but the influence of law was over your life. Even though the law wasn't in existence until Moses, that God had a standard of righteousness. He revealed it through the law of Moses. And mankind, before he's converted, will be held according to that standard. You're going to be held under the, you're, you're, you're living under the sphere or influence of the law. I've used neighborhoods just to say, you know, like, I don't know, it's probably a poor analogy, but if you lived in a neighborhood where they had neighborhood watch, and it's theoretically more safe than one that doesn't, the one that you were earlier saying we should ride our bike in, whatever that neighborhood was. Okay. The, but the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that when you're living under law, you're not receiving the influence of grace in your life. You're not in the sphere of grace. Whenever you get saved, you get translated from the kingdom of the darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And in the kingdom of his dear son, you live in a new sphere. You live in a new neighborhood. You live in a new place where grace abounds into your life. Grace isn't just, I used to say this all the time. Like that Britney Spears song, Oops, I Did It Again. That's not what grace is. People think greasy grace. They think, oh, you're just preaching a message that says you can do whatever you want to do. And then you can say you're sorry. That's not what the true definition of grace is. The true definition of grace is that it's a divine, that means God, influence on the heart. Talking about the inner man and its reflection in the life. It means it's an inside job. It means that when God allows grace to enter into the circumstance... It changes things inwardly to where it becomes manifest outwardly. All right. So when you're in the sphere of grace, you're operating in grace. Grace is in this place and grace is changing. Grace is strengthening you. Grace is empowering you. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. The power of the Holy Spirit does the work based upon 
what Jesus did and your faith in that, that gives you access to grace. That's what Romans 5 said. Whenever your faith is right, you get access to grace and now grace is doing the work on the inside of your life. But when you leave here, like Peter was doing, Peter was over here and he said, well, let me take a trip back over here. When you leave grace and now begin to embrace law, legalism, Galatianism, whatever form of work performance base that you put upon yourself. Oh, I can sit here and list all kind of stuff. You have to learn the scriptures for yourself. I do the best that I can, but you got to pray that the Holy Spirit would give you revelation of what it is that I'm trying to talk about. A pre preacher can sit here, and I've heard stories before even in this local community. People can sit here and say, but if you don't tithe right, if you don't read right, if you don't pray right, if you don't come to the services right, if you don't get involved in ministry right, then you're not right. And I'm telling you, there was one guy that told me that the preacher came over there and wanted to see his W-2 form because he wanted to make sure he was doing what was right. I'm like, dude, I, look, I've come a long way. Don't, there ain't no preacher needs to come over to my house and want to look at my W-2 form because whether I'm paying my tithes or not is between me and the Lord. Amen. Amen. We, we, we don't want to operate under a control spirit. We don't want to try to control people. We want the Holy Spirit to liberate people. Amen. The thing about living in the sphere of grace is that when grace begins to move on the inside of the heart, the preacher ain't got to tell you to pay your tithes. Amen. Oh, you can come up with all kind of concepts and excuses that you want to. Well... The tithe was of the law. No, it wasn't. Tithe was instituted through Abraham when he gave paid tithe to Melchizedek. The tithe was instituted through Abraham before Levi was ever in existence. Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek while he was still in the loins of Abraham. The tithe was instituted before the law ever was. Just as the promise was given to Abraham for eternal salvation before the law ever was, so the tithe was instituted before the law ever was. That's the scripture. The problem that we have is that our heart becomes hard. We want to hold on to what it is that we want to hold on to. And one of the first things we don't want to let go of is the money in our pocket. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Amen. I know. I've been there before. So one day the preacher said, you just soon not even give if you're going to give with a sour look on your face like that. You want to be a joyful giver. Amen. Amen. You know that you can't out give the Lord. Amen. Praise Amen. God. He holds, Amen. He's the one that, that, that controls how fast this thing spins. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. So spheres of law and grace. And if you're operating under grace through faith, now you're receiving access to grace. And grace is liberating you. And now there's a desire to know God's word. Instead of me like, oh, I got to read three chapters today or else I'm not going to just be pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. Come on now. And then whenever I only read two, I feel guilty because I set a standard for myself. Don't tell me that you never did that because I know if you didn't do that, you did something else where you told God you were going to do something. And when you didn't do it, you felt condemned. You felt guilty. That's law. That's the result is condemnation. That's why I'm trying to tell you it's a sphere. You can't concretely say, yeah, but I'm not following the Ten Commandments because that's some of the conversations I used to have with preachers in the past. Oh, no, he's talking about the law of Moses. Well, that's easy for you to say, but so you're saying that what Paul's saying is irrelevant for us today. No, there's a system of law that man engages in in his mind that he thinks that he's pleasing God and he's becoming righteous in the eyes of God through what it is that he's doing for God. Now, I've spent a lot of time on that, but I hope that you can kind of understand. Y'all just going to have to bear with me this morning. All right, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Let's read where we're going this morning. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now, the word there for foolish is not the same as when Jesus said, call no man a fool. Jesus said, call no man that he be godless. Paul's saying spiritually dull. You which are spiritually dull of heart. He says, foolish Galatians, you which are spiritually dull of heart, of heart, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect? Or brought to a place of maturity by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law 
or by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In chapters 3 and 4 of this book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul makes his defense from multiple approaches regarding the gospel. The first one, and we're gonna, this morning I'm going to try to cover two. I don't have very much time. But the first one that he discusses to make his point that God's plan is grace and faith and not the law. This is the first way he does it, is the argument of experience. The argument of experience. He wants the Christians of Galatia to remember the experience that they had with God and observed with their physical senses. Now, before you start thinking something, I can remember when I first, the Lord first got a hold of me with this message, whatever you want to call it, the message of the new covenant, the message of Christ and him crucified, the message of the cross, the word of the cross, whatever you want to call it, whenever the Lord first gave me a revelation of it, I was so excited because I began to see things that I had struggled with for so long fall off like <coughs> ripened fruit that falls off a tree. Before I was working and working and working and trying and trying and trying, now the grace of God was flowing and he was doing it. Amen? And I can remember that I wanted to tell people about it. And at the old church that I went to, I can remember I was doing teaching very early on and there was a minister that came against me on more than one occasion. Now, the Lord used me in his life and we, you know, I mean, I kind of confronted him and told him I felt like he had a spirit of envy in him and things of that, whatever it was, because that's what it was coming out. Uh, you know, that's how I felt. Uh, and, and, but, but this is what he told me on more than one occasion. He says that you can't preach your experience, Matt. You have to preach the Bible. And I said, well, I completely agree with you on that. But when your experience in the Bible line up, you preach them simultaneously. And that's what the apostle Paul was doing right here. He was preaching the experience and the scripture at the same time, because when you have lived Romans chapter seven and you've experienced the victory and the liberty, all you got to do is explain from Romans six and seven where you were before. And now you bring the two of them together. Amen. And you bring it forth. So this is the first question that he asked. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Galatians chapter 3 verse 2. He's asking the Galatians to remember back when you first got saved, how did you receive the Holy Spirit in your conversion? He says, this only what I learned of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did you do some special ordinance, some special ritual? Did you do some special performance to get yourself earned enough favor with God that you finally crossed over the threshold and you were plummeted into conversion? Or did you hear the gospel, believe by faith, and then when you did that, you were converted? Now, Listen, when you got saved, you know anybody that's ever truly got saved knows the answer to this. Because you can be driving down the road and not have no baptismal tank nowhere near you. You can be driving down the road and not have a Bible anywhere near you. And on the radio or a thought re-enters re your mind from something that somebody told you and it involves Jesus, it involves your sinfulness, and you come to the place of surrender and put your faith in that and then all of a sudden start, st stuff starts happening on the inside of you. Listen to me. The Lord, my vital signs started getting all erratic whenever I was in that service. That Service. I had heard the gospel before, but that night, my vital signs, I'm telling you, something physiologically was changing in me. The, my heart started beating out my chest. I know that I could be lying to you and you don't have to believe me, but I'm here to tell you, something happened in me. Amen. I could feel it. Amen. And I didn't get baptized that night. I just ran up to the front, fell on my knees and said, oh, Lord, Amen. I'm a sinner. I need you. And oh, hallelujah. Listen, guess 
what? The next day when I woke up, I knew there was some stuff in my life that wasn't right. Amen. Didn't even crack the Bible yet. I knew it. And I knew that God was going to have to deal with it. So I don't know where you were when that happened. That's the first thing that Paul says. Hey, how did it happen? Did you do some work and get yourself to this place? Or did you hear the gospel and believe by faith? Number two, this is the second question he asked, Galatians 3.3. 3, how will you be sanctified? The question is, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You started the race the right way. You put faith in the gospel. You got saved. Conversion happened. So now you're trying to mature in Christ. What are you going to do? You think that now by your flesh and your own performance and doing some external ritual that now you're going to make yourself right and that's going to help you grow? No. Stands the reason that it was through faith in the gospel of Jesus that allowed someone to be converted and it would continue to be faith in the same gospel that would allow someone to grow in the gospel. Look at Colossians 2.6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. <clears throat> Philippians 2.13. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Two things. How did you receive Jesus? Well, he just said it. By the hearing of faith. You heard the gospel. You believe by faith. Conversion took place. This, and in Colossians, Paul wrote that too. The same way you received him. How did you receive him? By faith is the same way you continue to walk in Him every day, believing in what Christ has done for righteousness, allows grace to flow in your life, Amen. to strengthen you, to liberate you. Not you trying to get it all done. Amen. It is God which works in you. Both the will, He changes the inside of your heart and to do. He gives you the power to do it according to His good pleasure. It was the work of the Holy Spirit that produced the miracle of conversion, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings the believer to maturity. I don't think anybody would argue with that statement. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. Amen. I mean, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Father's in heaven. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work on earth. He's the other comforter that Jesus prayed would come, called alongside to help. He's the one doing the work. He's the hands of God working in our hearts today. But he does it based upon what Jesus accomplished at the cross. Yeah. That's access. You've been justified by faith. You've received access into grace. You were justified because of Jesus' sacrifice and the exchange that took place. He took your guilt. You got his righteousness. Now you can enter into his presence. And his presence is a new neighborhood where grace flows and changes. Number three, did you suffer in vain? Galatians 3, 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain if it be yet in vain? In other words, was this just a bunch of waste of time that you suffered all this persecution? Because whenever I preached the gospel to you and you believed it and you started to stand on it, guess what? You started to suffer persecution for your stance. No, I'm not going to change the way that I feel and the way that I believe because I'm receiving persecution. Well, so Paul's asking them in Galatia, you went through all that persecution because you were taking a stand for what it was that you believed. Now they're telling you to, that you need to change it. Was all that for naught? Was it for real or not? Number four, on what basis did God perform the miracles? Galatians chapter three, verse five. He therefore that ministers to you the spirit and works miracles among you does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? One scholar pointed out that I was reading behind that one way that this verse could be translated is work of miracles in you. So he worked work of miracles among you, work of miracles in you. I don't think anybody would argue the point that the Holy Spirit works miracles among the body of Christ, but also works miracles inside each individual Amen. body member. Amen? <laughs> The change that takes place on the inside of your heart and life is a miracle. Yes. I read one illustration that that same scholar talked about. And he says, uh, so you believe that that was really a miracle where Jesus turned water into wine? This, and, and the guy that he was asking this, this question to was an ex-alcoholic. He said, well, yeah, it's really easy for me to believe that because in my house he turned wine into furniture. 
and a television and you know a house over my head a roof over my head and the point to that is is that it was a miracle that took place on the inside amen and so how did he do that how did god do the miracles did he minister them according to the works of the law or by the hearing of faith see one of the things that i would tell you too is that really when we talk about the message of jesus christ and him crucified Really what we're talking about is the, is the ultimate fulfillment of the new covenant. Does that make sense? Jesus said, this is my body. It will be broken for you. This is the cup of the New Testament, interchangeable with new covenant. This is the cup of the new covenant. Throughout the ages, God has been methodically revealing his plan to mankind. I say this all the time, and I don't mean to be redundant, but in the garden, it was the seed, the seed of the woman is going to crush her head. With Abraham, it was his seed. With David, it, Judah, it was his seed. With David, it was his seed. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. God progressively revealing the seed, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. In the garden, it was the skins for the first couple. In the Exodus, it was a, it was an animal sacrifice for the family. In Leviticus 16, it was a sacrifice for the nation on the Day of Atonement. And then on the banks of the Jordan River, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus said, This is my body. It will be broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. It, my blood will be shed for you. Jesus Christ, who he was. Jesus his, his the cross, his sacrifice. Them two coming together fulfilling the eternal plan of God through the ages. This is God's plan. This is where God wants his people. And in the midst of that, he performs miracles both in us and among us. Secondly, and I'm really going to try to close with this because this first point, because it's really going to be too, too much to, to try to do the whole thing. But the second argument, just to introduce the thought, the first argument was experience. You know, how are you saved? How are you going to be sanctified? How does the Holy Spirit work miracles among you? Was it because of what you did? Like when you experienced all that, you saw that going on, you felt all that happen in your life. Remember back, was it because of something that you did or was it because you believed what it was that you heard, right? Second argument comes from the scriptures. And the first argument that the Apostle Paul makes, because he brings them back to the Old Testament. I'm just going to kind of show you what he's doing here, and then we'll close this, this section up here. But is this, and for the first one I want you to see was that Abraham was saved by faith. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. I love passages of Scripture like this because until you really start to dig and study, you don't realize that like really through this whole, I think it's like six, seven, eight verses, he quotes I don't even know, like probably seven Old Testament scriptures. And you don't even realize that he's doing it because it's just flowing through what he's saying. And what he's doing is each time he's going back and he's hitting the Old Testament. Boom, 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 boom. I just talked to you about experience. Now I want to talk to you about the word. And I want you to remember the Old Testament. I want to show you these, these Jews that are trying to get you to get yourself circumcised. This is, what, this is what they need to read. All right. Galatians 3, 6 and 7. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Look at Genesis 15, 6. This is what he quoted. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now we talked about this when we got into Romans 4. We, we said, what did Abraham really believe in? And I told you, he believed in Jesus Christ and him crucified. And some people say, oh, come on, dude. Look, man, I know enough about the Bible. Chronologically, that's impossible. Abraham was 1,450 years about before Jesus. 2,000 years before Jesus. And what I would tell you is, is that, well, God gave him a promise that through his seed, and the Apostle Paul said, not seeds as of many, but seed which is one, seed which is Christ Jesus. Through your seed, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And then, he, and, he, and then in Genesis 22, Abraham laid wood on the lad's back, brought him up a hill, a father bringing his son up a hill for a sacrifice. Abraham believed God regarding Jesus Christ and him crucified. And because he believed God, placed into his count was righteousness. 
That's what the meaning is. That's the second thing, really, uh, too. It says salvation is for everyone. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. He's quoting Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I mean, you can throw it up there, but I'm not going to read it. But basically he said, In you, in your seed, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. The point that I'm trying to make, too, is this, is that Abraham was 2000 B.C. The law was about 1450 B.C. Paul's writing about 45, something like that, A.D. Before the law ever was, Abraham was given the promise. All right. Before the law had ever come into existence, Abraham was already given the promise, the promise of eternal salvation for the entire world. Salvation isn't just for the Jew. Salvation is for the entirety of the world. That's the point that Paul's trying to make. They're over here with their Jewish mindset trying to make you a Jew, but God's promises was for the whole world. That's why I got such a problem with this Jewish roots movement that's trying to make everybody become a Jew. It's like, I, don't get me wrong, I like knowing when the festivals are. I love it. Y'all have seen me teach on it multiple times. I, I love understanding the Passover and all of those things. But if you allow those people to tell you that you have to engage in those things in order to be really right with God, it's wrong. And that's what they teach, that you have to observe the holidays, that you have to observe. Uh, hold on a second. It's Jesus Christ, and it is finished. God made the promise to Abraham that all nations of the earth would be blessed and be able to be his people. Before there was ever a law, before there was ever an Israel, therefore the argument that works or law is needed to complete the work of Jesus makes no sense whatsoever. I'm going to skip through and in my conclusion I ask a question. Let's, let's look at Galatians chapter, uh, Galatians 3, 13. Yeah, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. He actually took that out of Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23, and we're, I'm not even going to really read it, but it had to do with not leaving someone hanging on a tree because it was, it was, a, it was a curse. The Jews really didn't crucify to, for capital punishment, they stone people. But under heinous crimes, they would hang them on a tree to show the world, to show the people that he was cursed of the law. That redeemed from the curse of the law. The word means to purchase a slave for the purpose of setting him free. And in this case, the intent is to provide freedom, not to purchase a slave, to make him another slave. We were with Jesus took the curse of the law upon himself when he was hung on the tree. Obviously, Paul's talking about the cross as a tree. He, he bore the penalty of the curse of the broken law for us to redeem us, to purchase us as a slave so that we could be set free. So the question that I had, and we're not going back here next week, it's going to be fresh. The question I had was, why after all of these things that God has done for these Galatians, would they now venture back into law? And it goes back to Galatians 3.1. Can you go back there? It says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you. The word evidently set forth crucified among you is like if they would have written back in them days posters and nailed them to different posts around the city. You remember back in the day, whenever on the telephone poles, people were like... Chuck, chuck, uh, you know, lost my dog or whatever, uh, garage sale. It's like a public posting to make people aware. Paul, the Apostle Paul saying, hey, when I preached Jesus to you, it was like posters were plastered all over the place. Evidently, in public arena, showing you the, the meaning and the purpose of Jesus having to die on the cross. So let me ask this next question. Who has bewitched you? Who put a spell on you? And that was the point that I tried to make. There's a lot of times that there's things that can cause blindness to our eyes. Works of religion are no different. One preacher said that 
that the works of religion are the most powerful narcotic ever known to man. That mankind will attempt through his own works and performance to please God and it will, he will think that he is doing so well with God because he's crossing every T and he's dotting every I. And the reality of it is, is that the work was never really done on the inside of his heart. Yes. Amen. Amen. And what he's saying is, who put this spell on you? It's preventing you from being able to see the truth. If you, in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, he spoke that parable, and I'm not even going to read that, but he spoke that parable. It was a Pharisee and a tax collector. And you remember what he said? That tax, he said, this is what it says. It says that Jesus spoke the parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. This is who he was talking to. People that trusted in themselves that they were righteous. I'm pretty right, man. I'm doing pretty good with the Lord over here. So let me just tell you a little parable. And what he said was, two men went up to the temple to pray. And one was a Pharisee, religious, prideful. He said, look at me, man. Look what I do. I pay tithe of all I have. I thank God I'm not like other men, like this top tax collector over here. And the tax collector couldn't even look up to the Lord, couldn't even look up to heaven, just beat his chest. Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus wants to know who went home justified that day. Amen. 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 See, that religious man thought he was right. He, you couldn't have convinced him. Before the Apostle Paul got knocked down on the way to Damascus, you couldn't have convinced him in a million years he wasn't right with the Lord. But he wasn't right with the Lord. And the spirit of religion, like a fungus, tries to hold on and cling on.